Vandana Shiva, the Indian scholar and activist, ain't shy when it comes to digging out and heavily criticising Bill Gates, is she? In my conversation with her on my Luminary podcast, Under the Skin, we talked about the impact and power that Bill Gates and other tech giants have and the negative impact it's had on Indian agriculture and farming in general. And Vandana Shiva was very clear that in her opinion, this is a new wave of colonization, every bit as potent and as destructive as the previous one that created the great or vast European empires. In this brilliant conversation, Vandana Shiva talks about Bill Gates's power the power that we have as the citizens of Earth, the subjects of Earth, the inhabitants of Earth, the, uh, what do we want to call ourselves, the custodians of Earth. It's a very, very beautiful conversation from an incredibly powerful human being and a true leader in the necessary movement to reverse the dreadful actions that are currently taking place that are preventing us having access to our birthright and living in harmony with the planet and one another. Check it out. And Russell, I think you'll have to do a lot of work in the next few years because they're going to do a lot of colonization in the name of sustainability. Just by chance, I was reading the rubbish in Bill Gates' new book. <laughs> I, I normally don't read rubbish, but when they try, want to be rulers through rubbish, I read it. And it's lovely because he says the greenhouse gases from factory farms are not because of factory farms and putting animals in prisons, but it's because the cows were the problem, they had four stomachs. And the four stomachs make them a methnipathy thing. No, you walk behind a good cow on a grazing pasture, she's not stinking. It goes even further to a colonization. He has put the Indian plow that has existed for 10,000 years and says, this primitive technology must go. I call this as the future technology of a partnership between our bodies, the body of the earth, and the body of the animals, realizing that we are not masters, but we are there to serve through what Gandhi called bread labor. The labor of our body in the service of the earth, in the service of community. So we are for sure at an epic moment where everything wrong is being given a new life, just at the time where the world was waking up and say, oh, you know, this dissection doesn't work, lack of faith doesn't work, desacralization doesn't work. That's precisely when everything is being crushed again. And I think this is happening, Russell, because of an arrogance that we have create, created such immunity for ourselves. We've destroyed every international law. We've destroyed all democracy. We have locked people into fear. We, no one can hold us to account. I mean, look at the debate right now on the GMO question in Europe where we created laws on GMO regulation and they want to knock it down and Bill Gates again is financing the lobbies for that deregulation. So there is an arrogance that I can't be touched. And you know, the British empire had that arrogance that sun never sets on the British empire and it's it. Mm. So I think if we, if we realize that we live in a power, powerful world full of energy and that energy is a creative energy of the universe. And our power is the spiritual power of aligning ourselves, which we call Rita and the right action. You know, that's what Dharma is. Aligning yourself with that power. Then we are very powerful. And these people who think they are beyond all accountability can be brought to account. We just have to ensure that none of us allow our ego to overtake us. None of us allow hate and division to become the way we start to think. And third, none of us ever give up the power we have. We are powerful beings in a powerful world. I like the thing you said about um, the sort of the uh, the arrogance, you know, the um, uh, of the the, the uh, colonial arrogance, and just the perhaps unconscious phrasing of the sun 
never setting on the British Empire and the indication, the syntactic indication of an unawareness of shadow, unawareness of shadow, unawareness of inhered darkness. I, I wondered too, uh, Vandana, if... Um, you know, when you're saying that thing about the unaccountability of Bill Gates and how that kind of um, mimics this kind of monotheistic, authoritative deity, a kind of a deity that asserts power and dominion, how this motif is recurrent historically. I, I wonder if in a, uh, a, with a, a, a theology with a different origin, such as uh, the pantheonistic ideas in the uh, uh, Vedas and Mahabharata. if there are you find tech um, ideals that mobilize for example uh, divine feminine power or spiritual principles that are plainly neglected in this um, materialistic ideology well I think the first very important gift of the Vedas is to recognize that the universe is divine. The smallest grass, the tiniest rivulet is an expression of the divine. And that's why it's not an accident. You know, we hold our rivers as sacred, except that now with industrialism and urbanization, we are polluting them. Um, our trees, Atulsi, the seeds. And can you imagine, this is so touching to me. When I go to the villages, women will do sacred ceremonies with indigenous seed. They will never use a hybrid seed for a sacred ceremony. For sacred ceremony with animals, they will only use the indigenous cows with the hum. They will never use a Jersey cow. It's quite amazing. No one told them, but they have that understanding of integrity and what the sacred means. It means to treat without violation, yeah? to hold the integrity. So we live in a divine universe and the energy of this universe is a divine feminine, yeah? Shakti, we call her Shakti. And nature, Prakriti, is her first action. And that's why even though we have you know, we've said Maya, Maya as play, but not Maya as an illusion. Maya as play when you realize you're in a sacred universe. But the part that has always been a very, very powerful idea from the way, Upanishad, it's from the Isha Upanishad. And this Upanishad, the first para says, we live in a sacred universe, which is for the well-being of all. Enjoy her gifts without greed. Taking more than your share is theft. So they have defined as theft, taking more than your share, which is why India for 10,000 years lived a very high level of living without taking from anyone else. But it wasn't just as a civilization, each individual. And we never adopted anthropocentrism because we had all these antidotes that we are part of a web of life. We are part of one earth family. And I'm very, you know, it's that thinking. And where did I get it? I didn't begin with the texts, Russell. I began with my life in the villages where ordinary women were practicing this. So and my gosh, they're saying this, let me go read a text. I went to the text following the practice of very ordinary people. And that's why when people say, oh, India is now a consumerist culture. I said, you're looking at that thin slice of consumerism. There's an ocean out there that is only surviving because they're spiritual beings. You know, millions had to go home on the day of the lockdown of the corona. You might have seen the march of the migrant workers. They could not have walked a thousand miles without a deep, deep resolve within them and a deep sense of their inner resources and, the, and not giving up hope. Otherwise they'd be committing suicide in the city. They did not commit a suicide. They walked with babies in their arms. I think the other part that for me is extremely important because 
You see, part of the dualisms that have been created are the idea that there's spirituality and there's materialism, right? But India and her thinking and her Vedas and her Upanishads have constantly sacralized the material world. So because I work on food now over the last 36 years, not through choice, you know, I did my PhD on non-separability in quantum theory and it's 84 and Punjab and Bhopal that made me look at agriculture. Why were we practicing agriculture in a way that kills thousands in Bhopal and 30,000 people in Punjab? Where does this violence come from? And I wrote The Violence of the Green Revolution. And since then I've been going deeper and deeper into the food question. And I just want to share two or three of the really inspiring parts of a sacred relationship with food, which is what they want to break right now. It's been broken partly with industrialism, but now with the digitalization, they would like to end it forever. And that's where we can recover it. So the first is everything is food. Everything is food in the Vedas. And if you think of it ecologically, what is the nutrition cycle for the movement of food? So everything is food. Yeah, an ecological cycle is the movement of food, and that's why I call food the currency of life. Second, the highest duty is to grow and give good food in abundance. It's your dharma. It has been put into a dharmic text, into the Mahabharata, into the uh, Taitri Upanishad. And the worst sin is to let someone go hungry in your neighborhood, not grow good food, and worse, serve bad food. So we've got to bring to the center of our everyday life, the rituals that make life sacred, our breath. You know, why is pranayam so important? Why is breath so important? Because breath is what connects us to the world. Water connects us to the world. Food connects us to the world. These are not fuels, you know? You know food as a fuel for a machine that's the, called the body. You know, this Cartesian construct has so outlived its time and the digital barons are trying to give it a little longer life. You know, they're putting their foot on the accelerator, say, go more Cartesian. And we have to say, no, go more spiritual, go more interconnected, go more celebratory through the abundance we can create. Excuse me, while I, because I've actually found the conversation very, very um, moving in ways that I didn't, in ways that I didn't anticipate. Do you feel, and is this even a kind of, is even this critique, um, if not reducted, reductive, somewhat abstract to a, um, a separate philosophical narrative, i.e. Um, do you feel that there is, you have a somewhat uh, Rousseauian regard for pre-colonial, India, which surely must have been beset with its own forms of feudalism and the caste system, uh, for example. Like, and if you feel that India that's only experienced the, this form of colonization relatively recently and is uh, suffering so radically, what hope is there for new world companies and uh, old nations, you know, old white European nations, um, if, if it is so deeply, if these ideas are so deeply embedded and the extraction of the sacred so um, uh, endemic and historic, or do you feel that, like you said, our species is young and these cultural differences are therefore all quite recent and perhaps the reversal and reawakening and re-engaging of these sacred principles m might be possible at a kind of comparable consistent and um, um, you know in tandem you know like is it possible that such different cultures with seemingly different challenges can have commensurate goals and can form alliances in support of one another from what ideological template are we to draw? From what archetypes are we to in, engage? And are there distinctions? And yes, do you? What do you say about my the earlier part of the question about like a 
pre-colonial India and uh, some of and the ideals and presumably contradictions that were present. If you enjoyed that video, then you should have a look at the rest of my conversation with Vandana Shiva. It's on Luminary, which is two ninety nine a month, which I know is money, but it's worth it. Coming up, we've got Edward Snowden on the show. We've got uh, Jordan Peterson. Who else? Glenn Greenwald on the show. Bill Gates is coming on. <laughs> I'm joking, Bill Gates ain't coming on. But it's a great podcast. Under the Skin, on Luminary. Subscribe, link in the description. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. If you want to hear the rest of it, and believe me, it's really worth it, go join me over at Luminary now for the rest of our discussion and for all the latest episodes of Under the Skin and my brand new meditation podcast, Above the Noise. Go to luminarypodcast.com to start your free trial and for as little as two ninety nine per month, you could be uh, listening to all this content. We do a podcast. We're going to do two podcasts a week for the foreseeable future. We're just looking at a, a vast, limitless expanse of podcasts. God willing. Thank you.